Okay, so um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who came because at uh, five minutes to two, there were just six of us here. We were deciding whether we should just bail on the class and go up for a six pack. Oh, <laughs> Now that everybody's here, we don't have enough beer to go around, so we're going to do it. <laughs> so what, what I'd like to do today, we're going to spend almost all the time on a whole like different aspect. We're going to talk about seismic reflection, but right at the end of last class, we got just a bit rushed, and I just want to kind of briefly go over things. You can take a look in the GPG uh, and uh, get Get a better idea of things, but just to kind of recap here, when when the Earth is sloping, then we'll still get a, a refracted wave that comes down like this and comes along here. So always that refraction follows Snell's law with respect to the normal incidence of the of, of the boundary. So this is always the, the critical angle, and then it propagates up like this. And it can be recorded as a uh, as, as something like that. So there's a direct arrival, and this is V U down. And then we introduced what was called a reverse shot. So basically, in this location, in here. We take, so here's shot one, and then here's the final receiver, called N. And now we take, and we reverse it, and then we put a shot two here, and then a receiver back over, over here. So you can see that the waves are traveling exactly the same path, and therefore must take exactly the same time, and that gives us a, a time point here which is called the reciprocal time, and that's this guy up here. So you can uh, get travel time curves that go uh, for the downslope, travel time curves that go for the upslope, and then you can get the uh, velocity of the top layer just by looking at uh, these slopes here. They will be the same because they're just traveling to that top layer. And then you've got two velocities that you've got here and unravel the information in, in those by looking at the intercept. So there's an intercept time here, and then there's another intercept time over here. So there's two intercept times that you get, and you've got two velocities, and you just kind of unravel those things to get the... Uh, the two depths. One is this one beneath uh, this location, and one's the depth between that. So that allows you to uh, get some extra information. When you go out, and if you're working for Golder or something like that, uh, the jump trees are more complicated, and so they'll use more complicated things to unravel what the uh, how the boundary is shaped but they're all kind of based on exactly the same principles so you might hear things like plus minus method or generalized reciprocal method or something like that but with the basics that you now have you've, you you you've kind of got more or less what's going on and everything else is just in uh, sort of deep details so on next Wednesday, when I try to finish this up, I've just talked to uh, the chief geophysicist at Golder and Associates, and he's been going around the province uh, doing both seismic refraction, seismic reflection, and MASW for various geotechnical uh, purposes, uh, LNG up in, uh, up in the north, and Prince Rupert, as well as some 
roads in British Columbia. So I'll show you some examples of uh, refraction and reflection. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. I want to switch gears. I want to now do reflection seismology. From the point of view of what we study at up up to now, uh, nothing really changes. We're going to have a shot and we're going to have receivers. But when we did refraction, we just looked at the first arrivals. That was the only thing we cared about. Everything else after that was obscure. But now, in reflection, we're going to try to get out much more information. And this is why this is so powerful. So suppose that you had, suppose that you had a geology that, that looked like this, right? We've got maybe some sand lenses here. We've got you know, some undulating bedrock, some alluvium, uh, you know, just complicated. Then the question is, how could you possibly get a picture of what is there? What we're going to do is to look at wave information, seismic information that go goes down and gets reflected back up it will not come as a first arrival. It's going to be buried in the coda someplace. But we're actually going to be able to work with this information and eventually get a picture that you just look at. And you're going to look at that picture, and you're going to make some geological inferences right from the picture itself. So everything is going to be involved in how we take our seismic experiment, take all of those traces, process them, diddle them around, and make a, uh, a picture with a particular kind of wave that goes all the way down and reflects all the way back to us. So here's, a, here's an example. Uh, this is at a fairly large scale. So this is five kilometers. So this is, I don't know, maybe 30 kilometers this way. Uh, we've got lots of, uh, this is sort of oceanographic. These are uh, slumps that are coming down from, you know, from ocean, so ocean is top, there's your something. Uh, you can see there's lots of uh, texture in, in here. Uh, there's a few lines that have been put in, so somebody has drawn them, somebody thinks they know geologically you know, what's happening, and uh, you know, they, they've looked at the underlying structure here and come in with uh, you know, where they think the oceanic crust is, and where they've got some decalments, whatever. So, a picture, knowing something about the geology, you start to recognize maybe events that are going in here and thinking, okay, that's a particular interface, so maybe that's uh, useful to me. This is a slightly smaller scale. Uh, this is in meters, so this is like 400 meters from one side to the other, so the other was 30 kilometers. You do the seismic uh, image, and you get something else that looks like that. So you get just follow the dark lines, and you can see some kind of continuity in here. So something's coming up here, and maybe there's even a bit of a break, and it's coming up here. Again, for a geologist who would look at this and know something about what the background is, you know, he'd recognize, like, okay, maybe that's a particular interface. It actually does look like there's a fault that's going in here. So, like, they kind of think this event here should be the same as, as this guy. So maybe there's some kind of a fault. And you can see there's a little bit of a break, and a little bit of a break, and interpreted those as uh, smaller faults. So that's the idea. We somehow want to get pictures that look like this, combine them with what we think we know about geology, and that's especially even better if we happen to have a drill hole here. So now you have one drill hole, gives you some ground truth, says, ah, this right here, I went from this rock to this rock, that coincides with that reflection event. Uh, if that's true here, that's probably true up over here. So that's, that's the kind of way that you extend your information away from some kind of place where you've got ground truth. So the main uses for uh, uh, exploration, the, the biggest one is actually hydrocarbon 
exploration. So by far the most, you know, the, the greatest employment of geophysicists uh, in the <coughs> industry is through the oil industry. And uh, the main technique there is uh, reflection seismic. But there's whole earth stuff. Uh, we can actually look at uh, waves that go through the whole earth. Maybe towards the end of the term, I'm, I'm trying to get through all the material so that we might have, I don't know, let's say a week or four lectures or something <coughs> at the end where we can just not have any new material, but just take a look at all of the things that we've learned and apply them to a whole bunch of different uh, topics. And one of them that I'd really like to talk about is whole earth seismology and you know what happens when you have big earthquakes and stuff. It's, it's kind of interesting. And then we've got uh, continental types of scales or we could have regional scales. So everything like that. And then we could also do local scales where we've got you know, geotechnical and, uh, and environmental work. The uh, the basic thing here, and this is what most of this lecture is, is, is going to be on, is that what we want to do is to get an image of reflection events. And so let's suppose that I'm a, I'm a, a source right here. If I had a picture, okay, of a reflection event that occurred every time we hit, I'm sure your name is? Right. Riley, so okay, so it comes down. There's acoustic impedance contrast right at Riley, so I get some kind of a reflection event that, that comes back to me. And if I could plot that up, then I'd have a trace, and it would have a little bump right at that particular time that coincides with the travel time for a wave to go from here to Riley. Okay. Now I come over here, and I've got a slightly different situation, but. My ideal seismogram that I'm looking for is something that you know comes comes down here, hits Robin in this case, and reflects back to me, and then maybe goes all the way back to Takata, Takaka, is it? Takako, yes. and reflects back. So I'd actually now get two reflections, right? So one from Robin, one from Takaka, and then. I plot that up, and the idea is that I could go along and get, you know, all of these traces, these seismic traces like this, and then I'd put them up on a picture, and I'd have now, you know, something that you know kind of looks like, you know, sort of sweeping, you know, sweeping around, and it, it would actually have the structure that, that I've got. So all of those, what I was describing was called kind of the ideal seismogram. And that is a, uh, a seismic record or seismic trace that is associated purely with what is directly beneath the source. So we're going to work with that first. So we want to really kind of get the idea of what that ideal trace is. And then we're going to contend with the fact that, wait a minute, that's not really what we get in practice because I'm going to have waves coming from all over the place, and I need to do something about it. But there's, there's sort of two different levels here. Uh, so I'm going to show you this slide first, and then we're going to go to the app and uh, kind of describe this a bit more in, in detail. So here's the overview. Just as I was describing before, we've got an earth structure that might look like this. So I've got different layers of particular acoustic impedance, rho and, and V. And I want to be thinking about waves that are kind of going straight up and down through these. I'm not going to worry about the fact that they might be scattering off at, at, at some angles. So the way in which we're going to think about that is just to kind of think about a plain layered earth and what we call sort of normal incidence. So here's an earth. So this is depth. And yeah, you can see we kind of try to hatch all these things. Uh, so these are different layers that are occurring in here. So each of these layers has got its own density and velocity. And we can take that product. And that's our acoustic impedance. 
So if I plot, so this is depth, say in meters. And now if I come down here, I know the velocity and the density. So I can generate what the acoustic impedance of this layer is and this, and I can plot this down. Okay. So now I've got a plot of acoustic impedance with depth. If you remember the very first lecture that we had, we had that the reflection coefficient was z2 minus z1 over z2 plus z1. So if something was coming in in medium one, and this, this was medium two, if I had a wave with unit amplitude coming in, then there'd be something that was reflected <coughs> and that had an amplitude that was given by, the, by this. So every time we have a change in the acoustic impedance, we actually get a reflection coefficient. So I could look down at this, uh, at this log here, and there's, there's no change, no change, no change. Suddenly there, the, there's a change in the acoustic impedance, and it goes down. So Z2 is going to be less than Z1 because going from a high impedance to a low. So that means that this is going to be negative. And then I'm going to plot a little bar there that just tells me you know, what the size of that reflection coefficient is. So it says it's negative, and there should be a scale on here. Maybe it's like 0.25 or something. And then nothing happens again until you get down to this depth. And then you've got now a positive reflection Negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So that's just a series of reflection coefficients in depth. When we measure our seismograms, our seismograms are always, you know, the variable is always time. You know, so nothing comes in, then something comes in, you know, then something else, then something else, da, da, da. This is time. So this is travel time. So we've got to convert these guys, this reflection coefficient log, into something that, instead of having an axis of depth, has an axis of time. But we can easily do that because we know what the velocity is in each of these, in each of these little components. So in, in the first one, you know, the velocity was V1, so there's going to be reflection at time t is equal to whatever this thickness is. So it would be h over v1. So that would be the time that I'd get my first re reflection. Except that when we deal with seismic waves, we're talking about stuff going down and back. So that means there's always there's an extra factor of two because you know, I know I have to get stuff down there, but it also has to get back. And so this time here that you you see is usually, and they'll off well sometimes they'll say that, but it's usually like two-way travel time. It's the time for the thing to actually get back to you. So it's got to travel down and back. Okay, but the basic conversion from depth to time is that for each unit up here where we've got a constant velocity and it's at a particular depth, we can convert to time. So for these guys here, the extra time is you know whatever whatever that velocity was. So we can take whatever the velocity was for, for here, compute that to a time increment, and that determines where this guy is as a function of time. Oh, sorry, this guy here. Okay, so we've got now this we, we tend to call and we try to be consistent. We talk we call this the reflectivity function. So this is now something that depends on time, and you can see how these guys they're they're matched up in terms of their polarity and the sign, but they're 
there are differences here in when they're actually occurring because not all the velocities for each of the layers is the same, and so time gets crunched up. Okay, so we've got geologic log, acoustic impedance, reflectivity coefficients, these are in depth, reflectivity function, which is now in time. So this would be the ideal seismogram if the seismic wavelet that was going down was like a pure delta function, if it was a, it was a pure spike. But in fact, it isn't. The seismic wavelet that goes down, that leaves, leaves the instrument, you know, might look something like this. So it's got a particular time for, for uh, it's got a particular width, or you can think about it having a, a particular central frequency, if that makes much sense. But it's, it's got some shape to it. And what that means is that when we take that reflectivity function, which was maybe something that looked like this, so now this is a function of time, <coughs> and maybe the reflectivity function is like this, then every time we see the arrival here of some impulse, that means that this whole wavelet gets put on here. So it'll look like that. So what these impulses do is to tell you, OK, this is when the wavelet arrives. What's the wavelet going to look like? Well, maybe it looks like that. Sometimes the wavelet might look like this. It can have all kinds of, kinds of shapes. But there's two things. One is the arrival time, and then there's the shape. The proper mathematical terminology for this is that this final seismogram that I get here, sometimes it's called a trace, it's called a seismogram, is really the convolution of this reflectivity function with whatever the seismic wavelet is. So all that means is that every time I see one of these guys, I've got to replace it by that particular impulse. OK? So that now gives you what our ideal seismogram is. OK, so now let's go through the app. Kind of do all these things again. Do this. So uh, see, let's just start from here. So here's. Uh, OK. Escape. Aha, thank you. You can tell how precariously these lectures are planned, right? One, one small misfit with a finger in your toast. OK, uh, here's what you'll see on the app. We're going to define the impedance, reflection coefficients, transmission coefficients. And a thing that I haven't, I haven't talked very much about but is uh, important and perhaps kind of intuitively obvious. So we've got a, a wave that comes down. It's got a unit amplitude. And then part of it gets reflected. And it is convenient and actually important to recognize that you know, which way the reflection has happened and from which interfaces. So there, we sometimes write these as two units, like this is, this is an R12, which means it's a reflection coefficient for a wave that goes from unit 1 to unit 2. That's important. When we did this, I wrote down this reflection coefficient as z2 minus z1 over z2 plus z1. These numbers here don't have anything to do with the layer number. It could be at unit you know, 30 or something like that. What these numbers have to do is with unit 1 is the unit in which the wave is coming in, 
and unit two is the unit number that it's going into. So it's reflecting. So R12 is the one that's reflecting unit one uh, interface between unit one and unit two. If I had something that was more complicated, so this is unit one, two, three, four. So now I've got, let's say, B4 here, B3. If I'm looking at the reflection coefficient from here, you know, now when I use this formula, I, I think, oh, okay, the, the incident uh, unit, unit one, that's really this guy here, and then here's the one that it's traveling into. So I would use um, you know, really the impedance from Z, from unit four to be here and unit three to be here. So the, when we're generically writing this stuff here, these numbers here have to do with you know, the incident and the other uh, one to which it's information is traveling, not a particular unit number. Okay, so that's a little bit more generalized in, in here where we say R I J plus one or can't see whether it's an I or a J actually. Um, anyway, I plus one minus Z I tells you what that inner what that reflection coefficient is at that interface and then here's also the the transmission coefficient so if we now go down something like that if you're actually trying to figure out what the amplitude is of the wave coming down so we've got a wave coming down but now it's transmitted so there's a transmission coefficient between that goes across here. So it loses a bit of amplitude. So maybe the transmission coefficient is only like 0.9. And then, so if that was 0.9 and then the reflection coefficient here was 0.5, and then there's another transmission coefficient here of, of maybe 0.9, you can see that the total amplitude here is uh, being reduced, not only because of the reflection coefficients, but also because of the, of the transmission. Okay, so now we've got this situation here, layer one, layer two, layer three. What I'd like to do is to take this situation, we're going to alter the layer thicknesses, alter the layer uh, velocities and densities, and get our reflection coefficients and reflectivity function. So this is, this is what your dashboard looks like. So D2 is the so we got D1, D2, D3. And so if D2, if this is equal to 50 meters, uh, right now D3 is uh, 100 meters, so this is another 50 meters thick here. And then I've got three velocities. Uh, right now, these are all essentially the same, They're close to 1500. And the densities are all the same 2300 kilograms per cubic meter. And so when I look at this, this is the density as a function of depth. And that's pretty constant. And then the velocity as a function of depth is essentially constant. So my impedance is a constant, so I don't have any reflection coefficients in there. <coughs> However, if I took, let's say, this second layer, so I take this guy here and alter his velocity. So now let's let's make him big. So now what happens? At 50 meters, 
the velocity increases to 3,700 meters per second squared, or per second. And my velocity structure looks like this. The product of the density and the velocity looks like this. Now my reflection coefficients look like this. So I get a positive and, and a negative. Okay, so you can you can take that and you can you know play around with it. Uh, you can do all kinds of things. It's, it's the product of density and velocity. So you can make the density go up and the velocity go down and not end up with any reflection. So uh, you could try to do that. So if I uh, I'll still have a have a positive increase in velocity, but I I could decrease the density. Ooh, I don't have very much option, but I'll try. Well, I decrease the density as much as I could, and you can see I've made that reflection coefficient uh, really pretty small. If we altered numbers a little bit bigger, I could easily still find combinations of rho and v that give me the, the same number. So <clears throat> I can even have velocity is changing, but still not necessarily have a, have a reflection coefficient. Generally, that doesn't happen. Usually, uh, these things are, are more heavily uh, just what the what's happening with the velocity. OK, so now we've got something that looks like that. Now what we want to do is to convert this system here, which was in uh, depth, we're going to convert that to time. So that means for each of these layers, we've got to know what the velocity is, and then we know what the layer thickness is, so we could compute what the travel time was to any point inside the Earth. So, and you can see, so here's our reflection coefficients in depth. Here's our travel time. So this is now how to convert two-way travel time to, to, to depth. So every particular depth, we can actually calculate what two-way travel time is. And then that allows us to convert from depth to time so we can see the first positive uh, reflection coefficient is actually going to be about 0 0.06, and then the negative reflection coefficient is 0.1. Okay? So we're almost there. The last part is then to take that, and we're going to put a wavelet on it. So in this case here, the wavelet looks like this. It's kind of like a Gaussian wavelet. And We've got a, a couple of things that you can you can play with. One is the frequency of the wavelet. The dominant. So let's suppose I've got I, I've got a wavelet that maybe it looks something like that. Okay. So if you were going to look at this thing and you see, oh well, there's you know this has got some width to it in, in, in time. So it's got some some total time duration. If I take the reciprocal of that, so one over time is going to be frequency. So this is going to give me kind of like a, a dominant frequency of this, this wavelet. So if this wavelet was uh, 0.01 seconds, so 10 milliseconds, uh, then that would say, so 1 over 0 0.01 is about 100 hertz. So if you had a sinusoid of 100 hertz, right? So if you just had a sinusoid that was going along here, and it was, you know, 
it was 100 hertz, that means you get 100 cycles per second. So that means that each cycle is about 1 100th of a second, which is 0.01 seconds. Okay, so that's the relationship here. Frequency kind of related to the time width of this wavelet. And then that's going to go on to here. So now let us uh, do that. So now I take these reflection, uh, uh, reflectivity function, convolve it with this wavelet, and now I'm going to get a seismic trace that looks like this. So that's my trace. So this is the information then that's telling me I've got two layers, and the time difference between these guys, if I know what the velocity is, is going to tell me what the thickness of, of, of the layer is. So if you look at that, you're going to say, well, you know, <laughs> that's not going to help me that much, especially if you thought about something that was, like, had a lot more layers and was a lot more complicated. I mean, you know, you just get squiggles all over the place. And, uh, you know, it's going to be, you can imagine that it's, it's, it's going to be hard to interpret. But there was one thing, and this is, you know, sometimes simple things make a huge difference. And for years, people would plot these seismic records as just these, they would just plot these things as, you know, here's, here's my squiggle trace, right? And then you get a whole bunch of them, right? And you get squiggles that look like that, and you're looking at this stuff and you can't make any sense out of it. Whatever. Somebody came along, and I forgot exactly, I used to know his name, it was, it was in the early 50s, and he said, you know, you know what we should do that would really help a lot? He said, we should shade the top half. Everything that's positive, we should shade black. <coughs> so now what he did is shaved it black, or shaded it black, which is what you're seeing here, and... The thing that that does, and you've already seen a little bit of that, is that it suddenly now draws your eye, and you can see patterns in these, what used to be just a bunch of squiggles. To this day, it, despite the fact that they do now 3D data acquisition and migration and huge amounts of processing, probably the greatest advancement in understanding seismic wavelets was after seismic <laughs> was like, oh, why do we shake the top parts in, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, what is going to happen here is, is not that we're going to get information from a single trace. The mind can't do that. But the mind is very good at capturing images and making sense out of images. And that is kind of where all this is going. Uh, okay. Um, good. So we've done the ideal set. Good. Okay, so we're going to hang hang our hats up there just 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 for for a moment. So we've now got the ideal seismogram. The next thing is to uh, to try to get this, and maybe I should just escape this for a second. And maybe let's look at this guy. Okay. What you're looking at here is called a shock gather. These are the signals that you would observe on all of these geophones due to a single shot. The shot is here, 
and you're going to see this again in the uh, in your team-based learning and your your case history. This is this is actually a really interesting example about the different kinds of waves: P waves, S waves. Uh, it's an example where you're looking for the water table, you're looking for stuff that's at the base of the table. Uh, it's just there's just lots of interesting that's going on. But here is a shot gather, and this is what your data are going to look like. Because every time you acquire data, it's always going to be like, okay, I've got a shot, and here's my receivers, and I'm dragging them along. And then I'm going to plot each of these traces down that looks like this. So this is time, and I've got, in this case, about 90 different uh, geophones or traces. That's your information. Now, what we were doing before in our, ref well, let's just go, first of all, let's just look at this thing, because there's a lot of stuff that's, that, that, that's going on here. First of all, there's, if, if you're sitting out here, you first of all notice that there's direct arrivals. So if you're sitting up here, there's a straight line that comes down through here. So that's when the arrival comes first. So that is a direct arrival, and that's the guy that's coming right along the surface. Then you see this other line that's coming in here. That's the first arrival, another straight line. So that is going to be... Refraction. refraction, thank you. So that's a refraction event. So, so far in what we were doing before, that's the only things that we looked at, right? But look at all this other stuff that's happening. There's information there. Some of it's noise. Some of it's noise sometimes and it's signal other times. Okay, we've got... First of all, this. there's a straight line. There's an event that's coming in here. You can see this. If you look at this line here and you look at the velocity it's associated with, first of all, is this velocity going to be higher or lower than either of those velocities? Lower. It's lower, right? So it's got a steeper slope, but the slope is 1 over V. So that's low. And if you actually figured that out, if you looked at that slope and you know measured the time, distance, you'd find like, oh, that's 340 meters per second, which would tell you immediately that it is? Nathan, where's Nathan? Um, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, direct arrival. That what? Just a direct arrival. From where? Um, from the source. Water. What? Sorry? Water. Water? The airway. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> Three hundred forty meters per second. It's the speed. Of, it's the speed of sound in air. So, when this explosion goes off, okay, there's actually also a wave that travels in the air. That's a pressure wave. Hits the geophones, makes them vibrate, but it doesn't come in as the first arrival. It comes in. Later. We're actually going to see this thing here in more detail when we come to do the ground penetrating radar because then there's also going to be uh, an air wave that comes through, but it's going to be real dominant. It's going to be important. Okay, so this guy's noise. Somehow, one way or another, we'd want to get rid of him. And there's techniques, processing techniques, uh, especially that allow you to get rid of energy that's coming in at a particular angle. So it's called FK filtering for anybody, but sort of like Fourier frequency domain stuff that you could put this in. And you could probably get rid of, get rid of that. <clears throat> then we got this stuff in here is, is listed as ground roll. From the point of view of seismic reflection, this stuff you just want to get rid of. It is, it is not doing you any good because it's not a reflective event. Right? It's not something that's bouncing off you and, and, and come or bouncing off something and coming back, it's rolling along the surface here. Well, the 
seismologist who's doing reflection says, okay, I've got to get rid of that. So maybe you could use the same kind of techniques because uh, they're kind of linear, right? You can sort of see how, how, how striped they are. Uh, you could maybe get rid of those. And then you're left with all of this other stuff, right? I mean, I mean you, you take a look at this stuff and I mean, it would be pretty hard to make much sense of. The other thing, but we're going to do that. We're going to take all these other things, but we're going to need a whole bunch of these shots. We're not going to have one, but we're going to have a whole ton of these guys. And then we're going to extract particular records from each of these shot gathers, put them together, do something with them, and lo and behold, you're going to get some nice reflection events. And that's going to be what's useful. The other thing is, this guy I just said was really... You know, it's noise, it's uh, it's contaminating stuff for the seismic reflection. But when we do MASW, here's our signal. This is the guy that we're going to try to work with. We're going to try to look at that information, and we're going to find that as that goes around, as we go from, you know, these near, near offsets to farther offsets, that the waves in here change just a bit and they're going to change in concert with the shear wave velocity which we then are going to use for rigidity right because that's what engineers are interested in okay so that's oh where we're going uh hmm okay so i think i ran out of time but i'll, I'll just i'll just conclude one more thing. Uh, uh, maybe you could read the GPG uh, just to, to do the following thing. Here's, here's what I want to plan. The idea is as follows. If I have a shot and if I have receivers, so now remember the reflection event is going to come, you know, midway between each shot and, and, and receiver. So I, I'm going to have particular points. Let's just look down in here. I don't want to that's right. I'm going to have particular points in the subsurface that are re reflections. If I then take different combinations of sources and geophones, you can imagine the situation like this, where I've got a shot and a receiver, and I've got another shot and a receiver, and I've got another shot and a receiver. They could all be kind of reflecting from that same midpoint. So what we're actually going to do is to try to take these plots here, which are common shot gathers, and we're going to extract particular traces from each of them so that we have a whole sequence of seismic traces that then are common midpoint gathers so that they correspond to a location that's halfway between a shot and, and, and a receiver. And then we're going to have a whole bunch of traces that have reflections from essentially the same point. And then we can go ahead and work with them, stack them up, and then pretty up our picture to kind of get rid of the noise. So that's what we're going to do. But if you could read the GPG, because, oh, Monday's a holiday. So then I only have Wednesday to try to finish, finish this stuff up. Uh, so I want to try to do the reflection seismic and a little bit of MASW. And then, uh, yeah. In order for us to, oh, and I, I forgot to mention the, uh, just a sec, our itinerary, which is, so we, we revamped things a bit. Our schedule. Uh, okay, so we are... That's right. 
yeah, so we were supposed to finish up reflection today. I didn't quite do it. Uh, so Monday's Thanksgiving. Wednesday, uh, we'll finish up reflection seismic as well as try to do a little bit of MASW, enough to kind of get you going. And then we'll have on Friday, that'll be the seismic team-based learning. And then good news for you guys, I will not be here the following week. So we're going to have, you're going to get somebody who's really good at GPR. It's going to be talking to you. Uh, so he'll have two lectures on GPR. And then we're going to have a seismic quiz. And the labs, so, so there's no Monday lab, obviously, for Thanksgiving. The Wednesday people will keep their schedule. So you'll still do your Wednesday lab. The Monday people who didn't, you know, were eating turkey, get the next Monday to do their lab, and there'll be no lab for the Wednesday group. So there's, we're, we're missing a little bit. The reason that I want to do that is I want to front end load. Get, the, the labs are a really important part of learning the course. So everything is integrated here. And so the earlier we can get you to do the labs, it integrates with the course, it, you know, it, it just makes it easier. So we're trying to do that as, as, as quickly as, as possible. And then the, uh, at, that'll, the GPR is going to take us through till the end of uh, October. We'll have a day for a midterm review, and then the midterm uh, will schedule for November 2nd. Good? Perfect. Have a good weekend. <laughs>